Well, my name is Todd Malone. It's great to have you here. And uh, thank you for being a part of our service this morning. Let me reiterate a couple of things that Slade mentioned in the announcements. First, uh, please join us for the Christmas Eve service. It is going to be just a lot of fun. It's going to be an incredible time of worship. Um, it is something that I am so excited that we do every year. And also, for those who were not yet in the room, a reminder about the Light Up South Ward outreach that we are doing. Uh, we are taking $5 donations at the Missions Connection Desk, which is to my left in the lobby. And we are using those donations to buy gifts for the children and staff at South Ward. Why do we do that? That is the lowest income per average school in the Longview ISD. Many of those children, um, Christmas is a bad thing for them because they get nothing. Um, and a surprising number of those children live in cars, things like that. So we, um, when we heard that, we just said, we, we need to, Christmas should not be a bad day for any child. So we want to at least do a little something. So I would encourage you, to, if you've not yet participated, stop by and see if there's still opportunity for you to donate $5. They can take credit cards. If you don't have cash, don't worry about that. Um, okay, this is confession time. It's probably geared more towards moms and wives because that's where I'm likely to get the most honest answer. How many of your families have children or dads slash husbands who if they know a Christmas present is for them, they are going to feed. <laughs> Fewer than I thought. That's a little bit surprising. Because <clears throat> you see the way out, well, maybe you just don't know yet. <laughs> see, because this has got to be one of the earliest forms of irresistible temptation, <clears throat> right? And I'm curious, are there any families here who use certain tricks to keep that from happening? Okay, now I'm getting more honesty. Yeah, we, uh, we do too. Uh, a number of years ago, we came up with the idea of using a number on each present, and here's how the number worked. Uh, we took the digits of each kid's birthday and we added them up. And that was their number. Now you say, well, kids are going to figure that out pretty fast. And yeah, they did. Uh, and there's really one kid that we were worried about. So we made sure that we changed the math on his. <laughs> and uh, surprisingly, it worked. One day he came up to his mom and said, I thought I figured out the patterns behind all the numbers, but there are some numbers that just aren't working. And it never occurred to him that the pattern was the numbers that aren't working were actually his. <laughs> we don't do that anymore because we had a bit of a um, a bit of a breakdown one year. Um, one year we went for CIA level encryption. <laughs> And the problem was that on Christmas Day, neither Ann or I could figure out actually how it worked. <laughs> <laughs> and even as we did figure out how it worked, we realized that there were some mathematical errors in our formula. So that is the Christmas that is remembered at our house for being the Christmas where we handed out presents, people opened them, and then we would tell them who they were for. <laughs> Uh, has a way of bringing out the two different types of waiting that we experience in life. There is the waiting that a little child goes through when they see the presence under the tree and they can't open it. And it is a waiting that is almost too much to bear because there is nothing they can do about it but wait. It's passive waiting. It's passively waiting for something that seems so good you can't endure it 
It's the passive waiting that leads a child to sneak into the kitchen and get a knife and slice out the corner in just the right place of the wrapping so mom and dad won't know that it's been opened, but you can see what's inside. And it's not important how I know about that. <laughs> but for parents, waiting is very different. For parents, waiting is decorating and buying and wrapping presents and inventing secret codes for presents that no one, including yourselves, can break. And it's a lot of cooking and it's a lot of cleaning. It's waiting that is incredibly active, that's incredibly engaged, it's waiting with purpose and focus. Even though in active waiting, you can't make Christmas Day come any faster than that little child who's waiting passively. It's that second type of waiting, the active waiting that we are called to and that Advent reminds us of. Remember, Advent is the four weeks leading up to Christmas, and Advent is all about waiting. It celebrates the anticipation that people had before Jesus came that first Christmas. And it also reminds us that we live in waiting for Jesus to return. And the name of our series is called The Meaning is in the Waiting. And as I've said each week, there's a reason that we named it that. And that's because in our culture, we are told that waiting is a waste of time. Waiting in line in a grocery store is a waste of time. We always try to pick out, well, I do. As I approach a red light, okay, which of these lanes is going to go faster when it turns green? Because waiting is a waste of time. But our series reminds us that God is at work in the waiting, and there is tremendous meaning in the waiting itself as the Lord seeks to transform us to be like Christ. And our series is taking a look at key people in the Bible who lived in waiting. And we start with Abraham, who lived in waiting for the promise that the Lord would bless the entire world through him. Then we looked at Isaiah, and he, along with the prophets, started to define a little more for us what that blessing would look like as they talked about a promised king that they were waiting for, a promised king that we know as Jesus. And this week we're going to look at a very unusual person, John the Baptist. And what we're going to do, as you saw in the reading, is we're going to look at a short segment from each of the four Gospels and what they have to say about who John was and what he did. And John is an interesting person to look at because he and Jesus were alive at the same time. They were almost exactly the same age. The first Christmas has already happened when John walks onto the scene in public ministry, yet he is still waiting. He waits for the world to see Jesus for who he is. He is waiting for the kingdom that Isaiah promised to come to fruition. And John's waiting is active. He waits with purpose. He waits with a message. And he waits with a life that is completely centered on Jesus. And the first thing that we see about John the Baptist is that from the beginning of his life, he waited with a purpose. Now John the Baptist's purpose was very clear even before he was born. John's life was to make people ready for the Lord. It says in Luke that his focus is on Israel because these are the people who are supposed to be God's people. They're supposed to be God's representation to the entire world. And God's people had been heading in the wrong direction. They had not been functioning as God's representation to the world. And so John is going to turn them to the Lord. Through John the Baptist, God would change their direction so that many would go back to loving and living the Lord as truly his people. John will go in the spirit and power of Elijah. What a fascinating thing to say. You see, Elijah was an Old Testament prophet. And Elijah was a person who ministered and spoke powerfully and was of great importance. And so it's saying that John, just like Elijah, will be someone who will minister and speak powerfully and be a person of importance. But here's the thing about Elijah. Elijah was never the hero of his own story. Elijah lived and ministered 
according to the true hero of the story. And that is God. And just like Elijah, John is going to live and minister and speak, not making himself the hero of the story, but always pointing people to someone else. The Gospel of John picks up that exact same thing. The Gospel of John says that John came not as the light, but as the one who points to the light. When the light, who we know as Jesus, shows up, John's work of pointing people to the light will prepare them to believe in Jesus. John's whole purpose was to point to someone else. John wasn't the solution to the people's problem. John existed so they would find the solution in Jesus and respond to him when Jesus showed up. For John the Baptist, waiting and actively fulfilling his purpose that God gave him, which was to point people to Jesus so they would be ready for him. That is exactly our purpose as well. And we are called to actively wait for Jesus to return by pointing people to him. And sometimes, even in our best intentions, we get confused about this and actually end up pointing people to ourselves. So I was thinking about this passage and this message. I wondered how many times, how many times have I said something like, this person needs me to be Jesus for them? That sounds good, but it's a little bit off. They don't need me to be Jesus. They need Jesus. They need me to point them to Jesus. My role isn't to be Jesus, but to reflect the character of Jesus and show them who Jesus is. I have two friends. One lives here in town. One lives in Colorado. They're not my only two friends, but they're the two friends I'm going to talk about. Um, <laughs> Who, who really modeled this for me. Um, they would be the first ones, if I had a need, if I needed something tangible, they would step right in and help. But here's the thing that's amazing about them. They don't confuse meeting that need with pointing to Jesus. So I shared with one of them recently that I had been going through a season when I just felt really tired. I was physically tired. More than anything, I was just emotionally exhausted. And he gave me some great advice, and we kind of talked through some practical things we could do. But then he got to the question that I knew he was going to get to. And it's the question that he asked constantly. He wanted to know, what did I think Jesus was up to in my life through this season of waiting? What a great question. That's the sort of question that cuts right to the heart of what's going on underneath my life. My other friend in Colorado, his favorite question is something like, how is what you're going through affecting your view of God? Another great question. You see, these questions go for the deeper issues below the surface. I don't just need a new phone app to help me with time management. I don't need another book to read. What I need is someone to ask me why I'm taking on so many things. I need someone to ask me, Todd, are you trying to prove your worth to people? I need someone to ask me, Todd, do you really trust the Lord that if you said no to this, that the Lord could handle it? These guys know that I need more than advice. <coughs> Jesus loves me perfectly. And as much as they love me, they don't love me perfectly. Jesus knows everything about me. As well as they know me, they don't know everything about me. Jesus always forgives. He always cares. He is always at work for my good. And this is not true of any other person. So these guys remind me that Jesus is at work in my life even during the challenging, the difficult times. And in those times, what I need more than any person can give is to be reminded that Jesus is at work. I need to know that he is working for my good. I need to know that he has not abandoned me. 
I came away from studying John really convicted by how much I am tempted to be the nice person, the helpful person, the wise person, so the people around me would say that I'm a good person. The problem is that's just pointing to myself. Like John the Baptist, we have purpose in our way. We point people beyond ourselves to the light, to prepare them for what Jesus is doing. And Jesus is going to show up in their lives, and we need to point them to him. This will probably surprise you. Probably not prepared to hear this. Um, being married to me can be traumatic. <laughs> Especially when we go out to eat, like we will today after church. At some point, the server is going to come to me and hand me a check. And when I see that moment coming, I am like a snake who is coiled, ready to strike. Because I know what is going to happen. That server is going to say to me, I'll take care of this whenever you're ready. As soon as those words come out of his mouth, my wife grabs my arm, looks at me and says, don't. As if that's going to stop me. Because as soon as he says that, what I do is I turn and look at him and say, when you say that you're going to take care of that, what do you mean by that exactly? <laughs> now, Anne thinks that the server's response to that is to head back to the back room and curl up in a fetal position because he had to deal with another really annoying customer. I think his tears are tears of laughter. I think that he is so impressed how I cleverly pointed out that his purpose and his message really didn't line up quite right. And even as I say that, it's sounding less convincing to me. <laughs> John the Baptist had a message. And John's message perfectly, perfectly aligned with his purpose. And just as his purpose is our purpose, as we wait in the in-between times, so his message is our message. And John the Baptist's message was both a command and it was an announcement. It was an amazing announcement. And the heart of the announcement, the heart of the message, is that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And you can read different people and you get different opinions on what the kingdom of heaven actually means. But in virtually every one that you read, you're going to see that they overlap in one particular idea. The kingdom of heaven is where God's values and priorities, his desires, his thinking are fully put into practice. In every way that you can imagine, people are treated the way that Jesus would treat them. Relationships never fail. Friendships never fade. Creation functions the way it is supposed to function. Think about what this announcement would have sounded like to the people when John the Baptist first proclaimed it. What they would have thought of is exactly what, they, what we talked about last week. God is sending a king. And this king is going to bring thriving and flourishing to his people and to all of creation like no one has experienced since the Garden of Eden. It will affect all of creation. It will change how everyone relates to one another. There will be complete peace. There will be the full knowledge of knowing that we are provided for and fully protected. One of the major themes in this series is that our deepest longings are for a lot more than anything that is on our Christmas list. Our deepest longings are for more even than things like successful careers financial security, happy families, intimate relationships. Our deepest, deepest longings 
are for the safety and security that never falters, for the love that will never fail, for the purpose and contribution that will always matter. We live for the freedom, for the boldness, for the assurance that comes from knowing that we can't be hurt and that we will always be touched. And that is life in the kingdom of heaven. John's message is that when Jesus shows up, he brings the kingdom of heaven with him. When Jesus shows up, he brings access to the perfect love that we crave. He brings access to the abundant, fulfilled life that we long for. He brings access to the security that we desperately need. And all the insecurities and all the fears that make us hesitant, that make us timid, will be gone. That is life in God's kingdom. And this is the kingdom that is at hand. But Jesus' kingdom is only possible if we stop trying to be kings of our lives. And that's why John commands us to repent. Repent means more than to say sorry. It even means more than the definition that I grew up with, which was to change your mind. It actually means to return to God, to abandon disobedience and live in a trusting, obedient relationship with God. Repentance is a change of our whole life, a change of heart, a change of desire, a change of priorities, as well as a change in behavior. I know in my own life that I'm truly repentant over something when I stop making excuses and I stop trying to hide what I've done. I take ownership of what I've done and I take ownership of what I've done and how it has cost the people around me. And I go before the Lord and say, this was wrong. Not because I'm trying to get out of some, some type of consequence from the Lord, but because I want the Lord to work in me to change me, to change my thinking, to change my desires, and to change my behaviors. And then, with the power and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, I step into that work towards change. The result of repentance is forgiveness of sins. And John assumed, as he's giving these words, that everyone needed forgiveness for sins. John called everyone to repent of their sins. And that's seen symbolically in the baptism that John did. It's a picture of the reality of the change that was taking place. And the result of, the, of repentance was forgiveness of sins. So this was his message. Everyone is broken and sinful. Everyone needs to turn from sin and turn to God. And God is eager to forgive. I remember the day very clearly when Jesus showed up in my life in a way that I could not resist. I was only six years old, but I was captivated by who Jesus is and what he had done for me. I have very clear memories of people who prepared me for that moment even before the age of six. I remember being at church in Southern California and hearing about sin. That's a good place to hear about sin, Southern California. I remember the things that I knew were wrong in my own life, even as a little boy, and that I knew that there were things in my life that a perfect God could never be okay with. I remember then being at church in Northern California after we had moved and hearing about Jesus dying on the cross and taking all of the guilt, all of the condemnation, all of the punishment for all of my sin. And although doubtless see, I've heard that many times before, it was in that moment that the connection between what Jesus has done and the wrong that I had done started to make sense. But it was even after that still, in a conversation with my mother, that I remember it clicking together that if that's who Jesus is and if that's who I am, I want to be like Jesus. If that's who Jesus is, I trust in him and what he has done for my relationship with God because what I have done only messes things up. That's what it looks like for Jesus to show up in someone's life. The Holy Spirit made it so clear to me who Jesus is and what he has done for me that there was no way 
that I wanted to live life without them. If you settled in your heart that you want the life that only Jesus can, Jesus can give because of the forgiveness of sins that only he can give, then you, like me, are living in in-between times. We live knowing that our sins are forgiven. We live knowing that the abundant life is found only in Jesus. But we have a lot of days that don't seem very abundant. We wait for the fullness of the kingdom of heaven. We wait for Jesus' return. We wait for the time when this world and we ourselves will be what we are meant to be. John the Baptist waited in the in-between times. In between Jesus' birth and people finally seeing Jesus for who he is and what he accomplished. He waited with a purpose, and that purpose was to prepare people for Jesus by pointing to Jesus. He waited with a message, and that message was, Jesus makes available a totally new kind of life. But the most important quality to notice about John is that his purpose and his message were not about himself. What was important to John, how he spent his resources, how he spent his time, how he lived, even how he died, was that his purpose and his message all centered on someone else. His entire life was reoriented around Jesus. And life waiting in the in-between times is a life that is reoriented around Jesus. We are naturally inclined to live like this chart. We are at the center of the chart. Everything in our lives revolves around us. And so the challenge of daily life is to get all the areas of life to fit together in such a way that it makes me happy. I want all the areas of life to more and more conform to my values, my way of thinking, my priorities, Everything revolves around me and my well-being. That's the default setting for the entire world. Why do people steal? People steal because they're using other people to provide for themselves. Why do people lie? Because they are protecting themselves from others or they are using other people to get something that they want. This is what life looks like when we are at the center of our own kingdom. The pattern we see in John the Baptist is very different. Jesus is at the center of his life, and every area of his life is oriented around Jesus. His purpose in life is to point to Jesus. His purpose is not his own well-being. Jesus is at the center of John the Baptist's life. He doesn't preach and baptize and gain followers in order to feel more important or more successful. He does these things to prepare people for Jesus. Everything in John's life, every relationship, every resource, every opportunity he has is centered on Jesus. That means Jesus' values and character shape every relationship. They shape every goal. They shape every priority. The arrows in the life of a person who has Jesus at the center flow in the opposite direction. You're not going to go through life fighting for maximum happiness, maximum comfort, and minimum pain. You go through life asking, how can you reflect the character of Jesus into every area of life? In how you spend your money, you ask what reflects Jesus' values. In how you talk to your parents or your children, you're asking, does it reflect Jesus' patience and love? And how you work, you are asking, does it reflect Jesus' integrity? Notice how this is different from saying that God is your top priority than family, than work, or whatever you are taught. The point in this is that you always, in every area of your life, have a responsibility to point people to Jesus. That's what life reoriented around Jesus does. It brings glimpses of the kingdom of heaven into every area of life. And so I want my family to experience that they are deeply loved and cared for because that is a glimpse 
of the kingdom of heaven. I want my neighbors to know that they are welcome and important because that is a glimpse of the kingdom of heaven. I need to remind myself that my well-being is grounded in something far more secure than finances because that is the kingdom of heaven. I had a living example of this last night. At one in the morning, I got a text from someone, someone who lives out of town, who is struggling. Now, my brain doesn't function very well at one in the morning. Um, so the Todd at the center of life part of me wanted to use that as an excuse to get to sleep. But because I've been working on a sermon, a little voice inside my head said, this might be a pretty good opportunity for you to practice what you're about to preach. <laughs> See, now Jesus would have the advantage of knowing exactly what was going on with this person. I don't have that advantage. So what does it look like for me to be like Jesus in that moment, to point to Jesus, to reflect his character? What it looks like for me is to take time and listen and ask questions to help me understand. I needed to take time to show that this person is important and loved. Most importantly, I needed to let him know that Jesus loved him and Jesus was caring for him. And yes, I gave him advice and yes, I talked through some different steps that I thought he should take. But the most important thing that I did was say, God deeply loves you. And Jesus is at work in your life right now. And we ended up having this incredibly special, just moving conversation that was a huge blessing to me. See, the kingdom of me and the kingdom of Jesus at 1 o'clock in the morning came in direct conflict. If I'd given into the kingdom of me, I would rather have just blown him off so I could go to sleep where I have tried to be his savior by bringing the solution to his problem. And I would want to have done that so I could feel good about myself. And you know what? I'm guilty of both of those pretty much every day. But a life oriented around the kingdom of Jesus looks very different. I did my best to show him the character of Jesus. That meant sacrificing a little bit of sleep. But I also did my best not to be his savior. I pointed him to the Savior, and when it was clear that it was okay, then it became appropriate for me to take care of myself and go to sleep. So how do we, how do you reorient your life around Jesus? Let me suggest three things. Step one, ask for it. Ask for it. It is not something that you can do on your own. It is a work of the Holy Spirit. So go to him and ask for him to help you reorient your life so that Christ is the center, so Jesus' values, Jesus' character, Jesus' thinking, Jesus' relational style is all working out in every area of your life. Step two is pay attention. Pay attention to the areas where the kingdom of me is still in control of your life. Pay attention to the places where your thinking and values and purposes and relationships are more about making you look good and feel good than pointing to Jesus. And step three, don't stop getting to know Jesus better. Make it a habit to read the Gospels a lot. Hang around people who are getting to know Jesus better. Hang around someone whose life with Jesus is something that you respect and that you want to learn from and learn from that person. We live in between Jesus showing up as a baby in a manger and Jesus coming back to fully establish his rule in his kingdom. Like John the Baptist, we live in that time with a purpose and a message. We prepare people for Jesus showing up in their lives by telling them of the forgiveness and life that can be found only in him. And we live this purpose and this message by reorienting life so that Jesus is at the center of everything we do, everything we have, every relationship that we form. And that's the point of the message. And I think that's the point of John the Baptist's life. <coughs> Waiting 
means we orient in life around Jesus. Ann made a comment to me. She said, God's timing is always perfect. Jesus came at exactly the right time, in exactly the right place, to exactly the right family, in exactly the right situation that first Christmas. And he still shows up at exactly the right time. We are called to prepare the people around us pointing beyond ourselves to point to Jesus and to live with a message of a life and forgiveness that is found in him. And I want to suggest some different ways that we can do that. First, what I mentioned already, pray. Pray that the Lord would make Jesus the center of your life. Pray for an awareness of where Jesus is not the center of Discuss the discussion questions with one another so that you can learn and grow from one another. I'd encourage you to go back to John chapter 1. And as we've done all through this year, go through that chapter again and specifically pay attention to what does that chapter say about who God is. And then each week during Advent, I've asked you to pray for or think about someone in your life who does not yet know Jesus. Someone who is waiting to learn and to hear. And I've asked you to pray. I've asked you to reach out. And now I'm going to challenge you. Is it time to deliver a message? Is it time to deliver a message that there is life and forgiveness to be found in that baby that came? It's a manger. In a manger. Lived perfectly and died for our sins. I'm going to invite the prayer team to come forward. As they come forward, let me just point out that on the bulletin that you received on your way in, there's a place for you to work. These folks are up front to pray with you regardless of what your need is. If you're struggling just with grief this Christmas, as many, many of us are. If you're struggling financially, if you're struggling with disappointment, or if you do not know the Jesus who gives life and forgiveness of sin, allow us to introduce you. But come forward and pray with one of these folks this morning. Why don't you stand and join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, you have called us. You have placed us at this moment of history. You have put us here in the in-between times where we look back on the fulfillment of your promise to send a king and we look forward to the fulfillment of your promise that that kingdom will reign over every area of creation, every life and every relationship. And although that day will come in heaven, we look forward to it. Lord, in the in-between time, we live in pain. We live in grief. We struggle. We are disappointed. But we also live in confidence that Jesus is at work, even in the midst of all of those things. Lord, help us to live this next week as we celebrate Christmas. Help us to live with the confidence and boldness of knowing that Jesus has shown up in our lives and he is at work. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Here is something you absolutely know about who your God is. Your God always, always shows up at the right time, at the right place, in the right way. So you can leave here this week, no matter what you are facing, knowing with confidence that God goes with you and that you have a purpose to point people to him and a message to make Jesus the hero of the story.
you are dismissed.